So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Armadana Hak. I'm the manager of program development and partnerships with the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy at University of Waterloo. And today, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Alex Veruti. He is a senior product engineer, enhanced oil recovery for innovative steam technologies, ISG. While at ISD, he has gained 20 years of extensive design and operations experience of OT SGs. He has held positions of project engineer and design engineer with focus on mechanical design, structural analysis, water quality, acoustic analysis, CFD, and FEA. In his current position, his responsibilities include the development and enhancement of the company of OT SGs for EOR as well as SAGD applications. And he will be explaining these terminologies in his presentations as well. He holds a Bachelor of Applied Science degree from the University of Waterloo and is also a licensed professional engineer. Please put your hands together for Alex Garuti. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming to this presentation. And uh, uh, it's funny how things work out. I, I was here a couple of months ago talking to Dr. DeSalt about some EOR applications and here I am two months later giving a presentation and not quite sure how it worked out that way but I'm really happy to be here. Um, I did uh, uh, come to this uh, university uh, 1992 is my year of graduation. I have a mechanical engineering degree so I, I know the university quite well and it's actually quite interesting to see how much has changed in the in the last 25 years since I graduated so. You don't look that old. <laughs> I got my young face today, I guess. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I'll, I'll be giving a presentation uh, on power and energy, and specifically once through steam generators and how they fit into the power and energy uh, sector. Um, I work for a company called Innovative Steam Technologies, and I'll just go through a couple of slides here and give you a, a little, uh, so you can learn a little bit more about my, about my company before we get into technical details. So uh, I'll go through our, our company, uh, where, where the OTSG technology started from. We'll look at the OTSG technology itself, some of the engineering challenges when it comes to uh, the power industry, uh, the engineering tools that we uh, use quite routinely in designing new uh, OTSG designs, some of the innovations that we brought to the enhanced oil recovery market, uh, OTSG, and also in uh, recovering heat from low grade heat sources like flue stacks, uh, low temperature flue stacks in the organic Rankine cycle, and some of the challenges that we see within the industry uh, uh, going forward. So we are located in Cambridge. Um, we have, uh, we've been there since 1992. Uh, to date we have 200 plus OTSGs, once through steam generators, uh, all over the world, and we'll, we'll look at a map of that in, in, a, in a moment. 100 personnel in uh, design, engineering, manufacturing, and uh, field services. Uh, our main headquarters are here in Canada. Our sales are here in Canada. Uh, we do have an office in Dubai and in Korea. Those are just more satellite sales offices. But we're close by. We're just over here in, in Cambridge. We are a manufacturer of once through steam generators uh, for four primary markets, uh, large power plants. So here we're recovering the waste heat from high grade heat source, like from a gas turbine. Uh, normally this would be in a combined cycle application where we're taking that steam to generate uh, additional electricity. Uh, many, uh, they're, they're also located in many uh, manufacturing facilities where the waste heat is used to generate steam for some sort of a process, like a mining process or a, a paper mill, those kinds of things. Uh, organic rank, rank and cycle or see heat recovery plants where we remove uh, heat from low grade heat source. Uh, generally temperatures less than 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Flue gas where steam doesn't make sense, so we get into organic rank. And, and the last type of OTSG we build is for the enha enhanced oil recovery market where we need to augment, we need to help bring the heavy oil to the surface. So we'll get into details in all, in all four of these as we go through the uh, presentation. Our origins started actually in the US. Uh, there was a joint venture between solar turbines and the Department of Defense. 
And at that time, it was called the RACER program. And what the Department of Defense wanted to do was develop a new type of steam generator that could be put on um, uh, Navy boats. And the steam generator would be compact, it would be light, simple to use, um, and it wouldn't be affected by the, the roll of the seas. Uh, there's another technology, we'll, go, we'll get into that, drum boilers, that's more susceptible to issues because of the roll and pitch. So what came out of all this research between solar turbines and the Department of Defense was a once-through steam generator. And that technology eventually made it to IST. It was purchased from solar turbines in 1991. Just a few examples of uh, actual uh, units in, in operation. The first um, top pictures are heat recovery units at uh, power plants, uh, recovering waste heat from uh, gas turbines. Um, because of their compact nature, you can see over here on the bottom left-hand so side, it's a power barge. It was actually built by Hyundai. And uh, it was, uh, I believe this one might have gone to India. There was an application where it had to go to Del Delhi, Delhi, sorry. Uh, so, it, and the, the, the compact nature of, of, of the OTSGs allowed for that all to be, as you can see, very congested, tight. On the uh, bottom right-hand side, it's what they're lifting on there is a power module. So on there are those once through steam generators and they build um, the power module and then lift the whole assembly up as one piece and put it on top of the uh, oil platform. This is a great picture. This is, uh, it's a platform that's being built right now by Shell. It's the Appomattox uh, oil platform. It's being assembled in uh, Corpus Christi, uh, Texas. And just to get a sense for the size of the platform, it's, it's built on, on, ground, on, on land and then it's going to be uh, floated out to sea. But you can see at the very top with the, um, with the, with the green circle, the uh, steam generators. So it's just, uh, uh, again, very compact. They're able to produce it on a, on a separate platform. That whole platform that, that uh, was lifted up into position just like the uh, uh, previous picture. Uh, last year we did, we were awarded the 2017 Shell Quality Award. Uh, Shell had very stringent quality requirements. Uh, it's on a barge, so, or sorry, oil platform. So there's no room for uh, having any um, manufacturing defects. It's not easy to get there to do repairs. So it's very stringent quality requirements and we were awarded that, uh, that award by Shell. Well, we do have units all over the world. Uh, just quickly glancing at it, North America project, uh, products in, in uh, Bolivia, uh, Colombia. We have products in uh, South Africa, Ghana, uh, Turkey, Israel, a um, whole bunch in Europe, um, England. So we are a world company, Australia, New Zealand. So. So maybe a, a good spot to start is looking at the power market uh, in, I'm going to say Canada, but I'm, I'm going to look specifically at Ontario first, but I think it could be extended to all of Canada and, and to some extent to, to the U.S. And uh, uh, this is a snapshot. Uh, it's from IESO, uh, Ontario Power Supply, and it's, uh, it's actually the power over... Uh, like a, a week. So in, in this case, it's uh, January 10th to 16th of this year. And uh, it gives you the breakdown of uh, uh, the power distribution between nuclear, hydro, wind. There's solar on here, but uh, solar plays such a small role, it's barely even coming up um, as part of the grid. Uh, and then uh, natural gas fired uh, power plants, uh, which is the dark blue with the red lettering uh, on the far side. And what's really neat to see about this is how uh, the power really changes throughout the days. So uh, there's peaks and valleys, uh, how wind uh, really uh, uh, changes over the course 
of days, but it's really neat to see how wind obviously is, cannot always be relied upon and you can see on, on the far right hand side there where the gas power plant had to fill in, it's, you know, the fill in energy that wasn't available from, from wind power. And uh, I know there's a lot of research going on into trying to store some of that wind energy, uh, but as of today, um, there's the, that's not available, uh, that technology yet. Uh, so natural gas fire power plants um, is a relatively clean burning fuel and provides the fill in power. So um, what this tells us is uh, we need gas power plants for the time being. They do stabilize the grid and they do have to be load following because if you look at it, uh, they have to ramp up and down, up and down throughout the day uh, to match the load requirements um, uh, needed. Uh, this next graph was, uh, it was taken from a report from a U.S. Energy uh, report, and it just uh, kind of looking forward, what's, what's going to happen in terms of the different types of uh, generation. So you can see coal-fired, uh, it started kind of peaking out in uh, 2010, it's uh, been trending downwards. Um, this, is, this might have been pre uh, the Trump era, so we'll, I don't know how much uh, Trump's policies will affect uh, the, the gradual reduction in coal. I think a lot of states will continue to uh, opt out or opt in for cleaner burning fuels. But the general trend is that coal-fired power plants are, is on a decline. I know Ontario wants to close our plants. And what's going to pick it up are, are going to be the renewables. So the green line, we can see that uh, increasing. And then as well, the uh, uh, natural gas-powered uh, plants. So I, I bring this up because uh, natural gas power plants are going to play a, a, a continuing role, at least for the foreseeable future. They do have a lot of waste heat that's going up the stack, and we want to be able to recover those with heat recovery steam generators. And that's where OTSGs uh, come in and, uh, and fill that need. So uh, once through steam generator, we can uh, just look at the technology and just get a, a feel for uh, uh, what's, uh, what the equipment looks like. So here's a, a picture of a once through steam generator that we produce. Um, you can see it on the uh, right hand side. Uh, the gas flow uh, is horizontally along the bottom and then it's turned 90 degrees vertically upwards. The dark colored region, that's the heat transfer modules. So that's where we uh, take the waste heat, convert it to steam. So a heat recovery steam generator, it's also known as a waste heat boiler. Um, it cools the hot gases, uh, most commonly from a gas turbine. Um, uh, generally from a gas, I say a gas turbine because that's, there's a sufficient energy in there to make, uh, to make steam. Um, so in this process, what we're able to do is regain that waste heat, that waste energy that eventually would have went up the stack and do something useful for it either a process or generate uh, additional power. And there's, uh, so there, there really is two types of generators. Uh, there's a drum type boiler uh, and then a once through steam generator. So we'll just do a comparison between the two. Okay, so we'll look at the drum type boiler first and that's on, shown over here on the uh, right hand side. So uh, once through steam generator, sorry, a uh, drum boiler is made up of three uh, heating surfaces, economizer, there's an evaporator, there's a superheater, and the flue gas, and this here, it it's, uh, flows horizontally. The tubes are generally vertical. Uh, there are some arrangements where the tubes are horizontal. Tubes are vertical and the flue gas flows across them. The water enters in at the economizer and the econ economizer just preheats that water to uh, hopefully something close to saturation. And then heads over into uh, the region in here, the evaporator. This is a steam drum at the top of the evaporator section. It's a large vessel. Could be from three feet diameter to five, six feet diameter, depending on the size of the heat exchanger. Um, so uh, the, the steam drum maintains a water level and the water kind of fills down into the vertical tubes and as the heat goes across, 
evaporates the, two, evaporates the water, makes steam. The steam comes out the top, all right, right over here, and then goes into the superheater section where it's taken up to superheat. So very three, three distinct heating surfaces. The steam drum, as we'll, we'll see in some pictures later, very large structure, is very thick. Uh, it takes a long time to heat up. It's got a lot of fatigue prone issues. It's not very good for rapid start. It has to be done slowly. Not very good for uh, rapid uh, changes in, uh, in, in, in loads. Uh, an important aspect of this is at the very bottom in here is uh, blowdown. So as you're boiling away the water, the impurities in that water tend to cycle up. So they need to continuously blow down um, the lower header so that they can uh, replenish it with new water and uh, dispose of that blowdown. An OTSG, on the other hand, is much simpler. It's just a series of pressure uh, tubes. Water comes in at the top and water comes, uh, steam comes out at the bottom. There's no steam drums. There's no heavy, thick wall sections. It's all uh, uh, thin diameter tubes. And the, now you don't have a fixed heating surface because it's continuous. Economize the evaporator superheater. Well, it depends on how much heat's coming in. It depends on your uh, steam flow. So if you look at the superheater at the bottom, depending on one load, it might be three rows of superheaters. If you reduce the steam flow, it might be 10 rows of superheaters. So it's very flexible in operating in a wide range of, of loads. Um, that's not the case for a drum boiler. It doesn't have the same ability to operate over a wide range. So just looking cl more closely at the OTSG, uh, again, water in, water out. Uh, they're all thin wall tubes. They're compact, light. Um, we'll, we'll see in the next picture the uh, pressure bundle. Uh, the tubes are, are uh, in a small proximity, uh, which makes them ideal for very tight applications like we were seeing there on those barges and oil platforms and pl uh, uh, plots that don't have a lot of space. The zero blowdown, so there's no uh, loss of water, there's no uh, loss of energy through the blowdown. Just quick comparison. This is uh, two steam generators. One's a drum boiler, one's an OTSG. On an LM6000 application, you can get a sense for the difference in size between the two equipment. Um, and the reason that uh, the, uh, the drum boilers need to have a lot of space between pipes and just the way they're fabricated. It's a lot of detail that I really can't get in, into now, but generally the tubes need a lot more space between them. You can't make them into a very compact space. And you need to have room for you know, the steam drum at the very top in that area. So if we look at the OTSG, we can see um, on the right-hand side is a completed module. It's, think of these as uh, complete modules. You stack them up, you connect them internally. Um, uh, uh, and then you can see on the right-hand side, the, the tubes actually, uh, the end cavity, so we can see all the U-bends. This is a picture in fabrication. Uh, at the very bottom here is a, uh, a manifold where all the steam is going into one central location. But what's really neat is the, the, the welding between the tubes and the U-bends, it's, 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 it's a very tight space. So there's specialized welding processes where it's an autogenous weld. So um, the two pieces come together and it's a, a TIG type welding process and the um, the, the joints made by actually um, melting the two pieces together in an inert atmosphere without adding filler metal. So that means your tubes are, are smooth. Uh, there's no you know, buildup of any filler metal that you would normally get. Um, and you get a nice, good, solid uh, uh, connection. Very important on something that's this compact. You need to um, have, have the appropriate manufacturing uh, uh, processes to be able to build that. So that's, uh, it gives you a sense of, of what these modules look like. So some, some of the challenges that we meet uh, de depending on market demands is the OTSG has to be capable of load following. So we've seen that earlier where the load is changing throughout the day. 
um, probably uh, summertime. I, I would like to see that graph in the summertime when everybody's air conditioning is, is clicking in during the day and just a huge power spike. Uh, so they have to be uh, able of, of load following, so we have to have flexible steam flow rates. They got to be able to start uh, from cold, uh, fast. Um, a lot of times the gas turbine will be down, gas turbine's going to come on, they need power, they have a power agreement with the province, gas turbine's got to come on, and the OTSG can't be holding back the startup of that gas turbine. Uh, other times we have to be able, based uh, for market demand, is be able to produce more steam than what's capable from the gas turbine. So in this case, we're augmenting the steam uh, production with duct firing, we'll look at that. And uh, the fourth part of it is that we need to be able to meet uh, emissions. Um, there's a drive to drive emissions down. Uh, NOx, nitrous oxides and, and NO2 and NO and uh, carbon monoxide CO. So there's the equipment has to be able to accommodate the emissions equipment and has to be able to accommodate the wide operating range that the OTSG will see with that equipment and stay in compliance. So, load following. Uh, if we're load following, what we have to have is the ability to dry operate. So these OTSGs are designed to operate actually with no water. Uh, no water, um, the selection of the materials, and we'll look at the next page, are such that we're able to operate a full GT uh, gas turbine temperature. And the, the beauty of that is, it decouples the combustion cycle from the steam cycle. So now I can start the gas turbine and I don't have the OTSG holding it back. I don't, have, I don't need to start flowing water. I don't need to keep the pressure tubes cool. I can start the gas turbine, bring, bring the steam generator up to temperature and then start the steam flow. Uh, so this allows a very quick start on the gas turbines and uh, it really offers a lot of operational flexibility uh, for steam flow because now I can operate with no water or 100% water. So I can op whatever the steam demand is for uh, the market is what we're going to end up producing. So just to give you an idea, we do have to consider these high temperatures and the need to select uh, the right materials. And uh, for so if you look at the uh, uh, tubes, well, they're, they're, they still have to be designed for the full steam pressure, but now they have to be designed for the higher temperature. And some gas turbines could be very high temperature, could be up in the 1170 Fahrenheit range. So now we need to choose the right materials. And uh, a co couple of materials that we use, uh, depending on the application, and there's a whole slew of different materials, is alloy 800 and alloy 825. If you can look at the composition over here, it's a high nickel, high chrome material. Extremely high strength. It, uh, it retains its creep strength uh, well beyond uh, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 538C. And I put on here a comparison to carbon steel. So uh, on this column in here, on the, on the vertical axis, is the uh, allowable stress. In this case, it's in KSI, and temperature is along the bottom. You can see how carbon steel, once you get about 600 degrees, it just starts to taper off, and it really shouldn't be used above 800 Fahrenheit. And then you look at alloy 800, and its strength is so much higher over the full range and extends well beyond 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a lot of great materials out there. You need to have advanced metallurgy if you're going to be op uh, operating in, in a dry mode. And it's not just the tubes. Um, this whole su support structure has to be able to handle those temperatures. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's just important uh, that uh, the right materials are, are chosen. Um, because it's a high chrome, high nickel material, you're also op we're able to operate with low fee water temperatures down in the 60 degrees F range. We don't mind having a bit, a bit of condensation on the inlet rows because the material is chosen are designed for operating wet, like they're, um, they're corrosion resistant with the high chrome nickel content. So this 
has a big impact on increasing the efficiency of the overall steam generator. Uh, so a fast start, we need to, if, if the pressure parts have a lot of thick walled sections, you can see a steam drum over there on the right hand side, big structures. Um, depending on the pressures, they could be three inches thick, uh, even more. And uh, so uh, that's, that's one of the issues with uh, starting up a drum boiler is you have these big thick sections that need to um, be started up slowly. Um, they need to be maintained in a warm state. Even if the boiler is not needed, you need to have sparging steam in there. You need to maintain temperature. So that's, those are all uh, losses to the plant. Um, a drum boiler uh, has those um, uh, drawbacks. An, an OTSG, well, it can be started much quicker. Um, there's thin wall tubes. And so it's able to, as I mentioned earlier, start with no water in it. I, there's, there's nothing holding it back. Um, and then the water flow rate is, uh, is ramped up afterwards. So steam augmentation, that's uh, sometimes necessary. Um, we can see the, the burner, it's usually a burner that's in the flue gas. And what we're doing is we're putting in extra heat um, to uh, raise the temperature. And generally, uh, the flue gas uh, temperature is raised to something 1,200 to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's quite hot, but it's able to provide that additional energy to get us uh, the steam flow that's needed by the process. And quite often, this, this burner is operated in, in, with a control mode where it's, it, it will vary up or down depending on the steam demand by the plant. Or they'll look at the steam, steam header pressure and, this, and as the pressure goes up or down, they'll either put more heat or less heat and make, uh, make more steam or take away steam. So why would we duct fire? Well, steam demand increases, uh, but there's no change in, in uh, GT load. The GT electrical output's fixed. They can't really, for whatever reason, can't ramp up. Well, they can augment it with additional st um, firing to get the additional steam. Or the gas turbine just doesn't have enough energy. Even when it's fully maxed out, it just can't, can't provide enough energy to get the steam flow we need. And in special cases, uh, we need to be able to produce steam even when the gas turbine is down. So in that case, it's what we call a fresh air firing. So you have a fan that's, that's teed into or uh, wide into the uh, duct for the gas turbine. Gas turbine goes down, the fan comes online and you burn uh, your fuel and continue to make steam. So you can see over here on the left hand side uh, an inside view. We can see the runners. Uh, those are uh, each one of these in here is where the fuel is injected and just upstream is this di distribution grid. And we'll, we'll look at why we need to have these di distribution grids and what, what we're actually getting from the gas turbine. An outside view there of the uh, burner burner runner supplying the fuel. So upstream of that burner, the burner vendor has a lot of uh, strict requirements on how uniform the flow has to be. We want uniform temperature coming out because on our pressure parts, we can't have hot zones and cold zones because they have the pressure tubes, I didn't mention it earlier, it's basically a whole bunch of circuits stacked next to each other. You don't want some circuits picking up more heat than other circuits, you want uniformity. So you need to, the, the way to do that is to have a nice uniform velocity going into the burner. Then we'll get a nice uh, temperature coming out and that's gonna help us with the uh, heat transfer. And I've got a good slide in, in there that will show us, uh, uh, that will show how that analysis is, is, is done and how the uh, distribution screen helps. Uh, just a, a little point. We could put a distribution grid that gives us a per perfectly flat velocity, nice and uniform, but at the expense of pressure drop. So there's always uh, a trade-off. You can, you can put more and more uh, smaller holes and get more and more uniform uh, flow, but with increased pressure drop, that's gonna mean the gas turbine is less efficient. So the gas turbine manufacturers put very strict requirements on us on how much pressure drop we can, how much pressure we can put back on their GT. Um, at some point, they actually start to lose efficiency. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, 
something we need to consider. That's, what do you mean by that? That's the back, back pressure on the... That's the back pressure on the gas turbine, okay. yeah. Okay, so uh, we, we talked about the low following, we talked about quick starts and uh, steam aug augmentation. The fourth one is emissions. Um, so there's a couple of different technologies that are used to control emissions. What we're looking at here is uh, reducing emissions of NOx. Uh, it's part of the combustion process. It's uh, this nitrogen in the combustion air and uh, the nitrogen combines uh, with the oxygen, forms uh, NOx, uh, which is, uh, stands for uh, either NO or NO2. It um, can cause uh, smog, it can cause uh, um, acidic rainfall. So there, there's a real drive to drive down the, the NOx. It's a, a re regulatory requirement that's imposed on uh, many power plants. And uh, so, uh, what this involves is injecting ammonia into the gas stream. The ammonia combines with the uh, NOx on top of a catalyst and the output is uh, nitrogen and water. So two harmless substances. There are a couple of other uh, undesired re reactions. Some of the SO2 will combine with oxygen to form SO3. SO3 is a precursor to uh, sulfuric acid. So. Um, it's very, uh, that's something that's balanced, trying to find the right catalyst that minimizes the amount of SO3 formed. And then the other thing that's, that can happen is some of the SO3 can, can combine with ammonia to form ammonium bisulfate. It's a sticky substance. It sticks to the outlet of the heating surface. Um, you you re re reduce efficiency. It's not easy to get off. It's acidic. So it's something that we try to avoid. It looks like great fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> but not good in the boiler. Uh, if we look at uh, the OTSG, we can see uh, the equipment, um, how it would be laid out. So uh, you can see in green in here, this is a layer of CO catalyst. CO catalyst is a platinum. Uh, it's a, it's a sheets of platinum inside these modules. And the platinum converts to CO to CO2. The AIG is after that. That's the ammonia injection grid. That's where we inject the ammonia. And then the very top color here would be the SCR module. Uh, and we'll see some pictures of what that looks like. Um, point here is it does take up a lot of uh, space. It's, uh, it's not m a minor piece of equipment. Uh, as you can see, uh, a big chunk of that vertical section is uh, emissions equipment. So just looking um, in this picture, we can see uh, the catalyst blocks on the uh, Left-hand side, it's a, it's a number of blocks, and they're put inside the reactor, uh, stacked next to each other, and the flue gas flow just kind of goes through them. You can see in here this white part in here, that's the catalyst itself. So some close-up views. Um, the top right-hand corner is looking at it from the bottom, so you can see the support structure. Uh, that structure has to be able to handle these high dry running temperatures. Um, when there's catalysts, you don't really allow it to go up to 1170 because there's some negative effects to the catalyst. So you limit the dry running temperatures. Um, the catalyst tends to degrade uh, at elevated temperatures. So it's, it's a fine balance between um, dry operation and number of hours allowed at dry operation. If you look at the, uh, uh, this picture in here, it's a, it's a close-up. The catalyst is a titanium oxide. It's a, it's, a, it's a paste, and it's impregnated onto a stainless steel wire mesh, and then it's formed into these corrugated sheets, and all these corrugated sheets are put next to each other, and the flue, oops, and the flue gas ends up flowing in between all these little holes, and that's where the reaction happens. This is a, a picture of the ammonia injection grid. It's a series of pipes. They're not overly complex. Series of pipes with a bunch of holes in them. The holes is where the ammonia is uh, um, ejected. What we see here as well in this picture is this upstream CO catalyst. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just a layer of catalyst. It's about, uh, I don't know, three inches thick. And it's blocks put onto a frame and all the flue gas flows uh, up through, through that catalyst and uh, CO is converted to CO2. 
The, the benefit of having the, the catalyst upstream of the AIG is it helps to even out the flow. Um, really important to have uniform flow. Interestingly, if this catalyst was put after the AIG, the catalyst would react, uh, would convert the ammonia into NOx. <laughs> so you would actually be creating NOx. So it's, it's really important that it's put far enough upstream that it doesn't cause that issue. So some of the tools that we use, um, and this is kind of getting into the technicals, is uh, finite element analysis. We're, we're working with a hot boiler. It's expanding, it's sliding everywhere. Um, there's, uh, we, we, need, we, we need to know the, the stresses and, and the deflections and really can't do it using classical methods, so um, FEA becomes a major part of that. The other one is uh, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Um, we need to have uniform flows at the burner, at the SCR, at the AIG. So again, CFD is an important tool. So I just, uh, I just grabbed a, a picture of one of the models uh, that we would uh, develop. Um, you can see that over here on the uh, right-hand side. All the horizontal lines, that would be your pressure tubes. Uh, these pressure tubes are supported vertically with what we call tube sheets. Just think, think of a, a sheet with a bunch of holes in there and the tubes are going through the tube sheet. Uh, so we model the tube sheets, we model the tubes, we model the upper support structure, we apply uh, from our thermodynamic model, we were able to get gas temperatures and we're able to get tube temperatures, lay it on top of the actual model, calculate all of the thermal stresses, deflections, and, and make sure that we meet ASME requirements for uh, bending stresses and, and uh, mechanical loads. Now for, for uh, for CFD, I, I included this picture here. This is uh, the exhaust of a gas turbine. So uh, a lot of people don't realize gas turbines, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a rotational volumetric device, right? So the, the flue gas coming out from a gas turbine has a very strong swirl profile. You can see that in here by the arrows. Um, it's got a, a rotation. And the flow coming out is, is uh, highly non-uniform. Uh, you can see the red regions, very high velocities, 200 feet per second. And uh, other, other regions, it's down in the 40 feet per second. One spot up there doesn't have almost any flow. So now we have to take this. This is just upstream of our burner. We have to take this now and, and somehow straighten it out to the point that we can put fuel in through the burner and get a nice uniform heat uh, release. So this, this is an example of one of the analysis that we've done. You can see the initial temperatures, initial flows. So we model the burner itself. So we're modeling the heat release from the runners. And what we can see is uh, there's a hot region up, up in here. And we also see that the velocity is actually pretty high along the bottom, right? Because it's coming out the gas turbine and it hasn't expanded upwards. And these actually work out well together because if the velocity is high and I'm putting in a set amount of fuel at each one of these locations, that means I'm diluting the temperature and I'm not putting enough flow up here. So this will naturally run hotter and this will naturally run colder. So with the CFD, after a whole bunch of trial and errors of different combinations of porosities, different number, number of plates, we end up with the final temperature on the far side. So you can see how much more uniform it is. Now the pressure parts downstream are gonna see a nice uniform temperature and, uh, and operate with similar temperatures uh, between all the different tubes. Here's an example of a vertical fired uh, uh, configuration. So this is uh, for uh, a particular oil platform. We have the heating surface at the top. We model the actual flame. In the previous model, we were just modeling a heat input. Here we model, we actually did a combustion analysis. So we're actually mixing the fuel with the, with the uh, uh, flue gas so that we're able to get a nice accurate uh, determination of the radiant heat fluxes from the flame to the downstream equipment and have an accurate 
determination on what will be the gas temperature entering the heat transfer surface. So it's just a full-blown um, uh, combustion analysis. Now, remember earlier we were talking about the SCR and uh, we need to inject ammonia and we've seen the ammonia injection grid, the, the little holes. Well, we need to do a whole bunch of, there has to be really uniform mixing of the ammonia with the NOx. And we do that by, we confirm that by doing a bunch of CFD. We know, we, we want to make sure that the ammonia coming out of the, each of the holes in the piping is uniform. And when the, so when the ammonia comes out, it comes out as a plume, right? It's, it comes out as a plume. We want to make sure that the, all those plumes kind of spread out. And then at the SCR, they've kind of all kind of coalesced together into a somewhat uniform uh, concentration of, a, of ammonia. And so what we're looking at here is, this is actually not uniform. There's, there's high regions, low regions, some stuff in the middle. This was actually one of our initial runs we had to change the configuration of the AIG piping. We had to put in uh, devices in there to promote mixing of the ammonia with the flue gas. So what we see here is just, uh, if this was allowed to go into the SCR, the SCR would not function very well. It needs to have a uniform, all the, all the catalyst has to operate at its peak efficiency. So you need to have, um, you, you, you can't have some areas with too much NOx sorry, too much ammonia, because that ammonia will slip through and you'll get ammonia slip. If you have uh, not enough, then you don't have enough reaction and NOx will, will slip through. So innovation, uh, it's, it's really key to develop uh, new markets. And I'm just gonna sh share with you a couple of uh, uh, um, products that uh, we, we've, uh, worked on developing and, and uh, offering the needs to the, uh, to, to the market. Uh, one of them is uh, Enhanced Oil Recovery, OTSG. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to start off, just quickly show where, where, where Canada stands, you know, in, in terms of enha Enhanced Oil Recovery. The current climate in Canada uh, uh, does see a uh, continual uh, growth in the in situ market. So there's two ways of it. Part of Canada's energy security is we do have to develop our own oil, we, you know. And, uh, uh, and in doing so, the uh, Alberta oil sands plays a significant role in, in, in that part of it. Uh, so what we look at here, what we can see here is there's two primary ways oil sands are extracted. One is mining, which is the purple one. And then in situ process would be um, like uh, SAG-D uh, and CSS. SAG-D is a, uh, the next slide will, sh will show what a SAG-D process looks like. But essentially, 80% um, of the oil sands is only accessible by uh, in situ methods. And these methods, the most proven way to remove that oil at this point is uh, steam injection. Um, the steam uh, lowers the viscosity, helps uh, pressurizes the ground, helps to flow that, that oil to the surface. And SAG-D uh, is playing a, uh, a primary role. OTSGs, once through steam generators, is a predominant uh, equipment that supplies steam for this process. So just real quickly for, for, uh, for those of us who don't know uh, what a SAG-D process is, uh, it's basically two wells that are ejected, that are put into the ground. Uh, the upper, and, and they're focused into the oil reservoir. Uh, the, the upper well is, the upper pipe is the steam injection, and the lower pipe is the producer. So steam enters the upper pipe, heats up the oil formation, uh, and creates a steam chest, and uh, that then flows down into the lower pipe where, uh, uh, the, the, the liquefied uh, bitumen, in this case, is extracted up to the um, uh, surface um, for, for processing. What's really neat is this is roughly, I don't know, kilometer underground. 400 meters. 500. 500 meters, and then it's like a kilometer in length, and they're able to do directional drilling, keep them. 
you know, if if they're off like this, or you know, if, if uh, or if they miss the uh, the payload area, that's just it's it's a very tricky uh, 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 business, uh, and they're only five meters apart, so they're <laughs> really close. <coughs> this is actually a project that we're just in the process of completing. Uh, it's at the Lower Fars um, oil field in Kuwait. Uh, this first phase, I think, will produce around 30,000 barrels a day. Uh, this is for a, a cyclic steam application, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, eventually this, 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 this phase will be uh, double, so it'll be uh, 60,000 barrels a day. It's the, really the, the main heavy oil, uh, oil field in uh, Kuwait that's, uh, that's being developed. So I want to look at the uh, OTSG because it's going to lead into what our innovation is. So on the bottom right-hand corner, we can see it's a once-through design. So uh, water goes in at the very top in here. It goes through this module, which, which is the convective module. We can see that up in the upper picture. Um, it's just a bunch of tubes where the water goes in. It's a once-through design. And then from there, it goes into this section. And this section over here is the radiant chamber. And that's where the combustion, uh, normally it's natural gas, uh, the combustion fuel occurs. The uh, radiant chamber is lined with a series of pipes, and uh, so this, the water flows, steam flows through those pipes, and exits as a wet steam mixture, usually 75 to 80 percent uh, steam quality. These 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 type of units use uh, uh, very uh, the water quality for these units are, uh, has a lot of impurities, has a lot of dissolved solids, organics. And I really like the picture at the top because the middle picture, that's the color of the water going into the boiler. And, it's, uh, and um, the reason is um, the water is not highly purified is in, when we use an in-situ in process, what comes up from the ground is going to be like an oil or a bitumen mixed with water. The idea is to be environmentally friendly, so we want to take that water, we want to clean it, put it back into the steam generator. So if, if you had to clean it completely uh, clean like you would like for a, a, a typical drum boiler or, or a power boiler, it would just be too prohibitive. So what you do is you clean it to a certain level, put it in the boiler, and then operate with a mixed steam, uh, with a, uh, with a uh, mixed steam quality so that uh, you're not fully vaporizing all the water, and the impurities are able to exit the steam generator. So in the industry up to this point uh, had uh, smooth, pipe, uh, smooth pipes in their uh, radiant chamber. So if we were to look at a flow regime inside this pipe, generally it operates with annular flow. The velocities are high enough that we don't get separation. We operate with annular flow. There's a whole bunch of entrained droplets. Uh, the water on the surface is evaporating with the radiant heat uh, hit, hitting the surface. And as long as it operates this way, it's great. The impurities are cycling up in the remaining water and they exit the outlet of the radiant chamber. And generally, the industry operates at 75 to 80 percent. The problem is um, the industry needs more efficiency. And um, all that. So when it's coming out at 80% steam quality, well, 20% is water. And uh, like a SAG-D process, we don't want to inject that water. It's not, it doesn't work well with that type of process. So all that water has to be recycled, disposed of, a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of wastage. So um, what we've seen is a solution to operate at a higher quality. And we, we call that the SQ90. So in, instead of a smooth pipe, um, inside the radiant chamber. Now we have a rifle pipe. And um, the reason we added the rifle pipe is we want to make sure all the water, including the water in the steam core, which are droplets, they're not really part of the evaporation process, we want to move those all out to the surface. So what happens is, if we go back to the previous slide, 
The droplets are not really evaporating. They're just kind of going along with the steam core. The water on the surface is evaporating. So now the impurities are cycling up, concentrating more and more on the, on the surface. The entrained droplets are operating at a, high, at a lower steam quality, sorry, at a lower impurity concentration. And we, we, we don't have, and, and so when you operate beyond 80%, you run the risk of getting deposits in your tubing. So that's why it's an industry standard, 80% maximum. Now, if we take all that water, we move it to the surface, and I'll just show you, I'm just gonna flip ahead here. So by, by putting a rotational spin to the steam flow, centrifugal force now equalizes the thickness of the water all, all the way around to an equal thickness. You don't have, the bottom is thicker because of gravity effects bringing it down. And all those droplets on the steam core are now on the pipe surface. So everything is now in, e evaporating on the pipe surface and we don't have some water in the core, some water on the surface. So with that, we're, we were able to do an industry first 90% steam quality operation. That's with the water that we've seen in here. So we don't need any special water. It's the same water, just operating at higher steam quality. So we do have a patent on this uh, in Canada, US, and the GCC, which is, is pending. OK, our other area that we've been focusing on is the um, organic Rankine cycle OTSG. So there's a lot of small gas turbines, reciprocating engines. There's a lot of uh, waste heat going up the stacks. Uh, interestingly, the US Department of Energy estimates 1.5 to 2 quadrillion BTUs per hour uh, with gas temperatures less than 500 going up the stacks. There's a lot of energy uh, that, if we could, if, that if we're able to tap into that market uh, could could have a significant impact on lowering um, carbon, our, the Canadian carbon footprint, right? Uh, if we are able to extract that heat and uh, make uh, power from it or use that heat in a, in a, in a manufacturing process, it uh, avoids use of burning additional fossil fuels. But the issue with a lot of these heat sources is the temperature just isn't there for a steam cycle. There's just not enough heat to pr produce a meaningful amount of steam flow. Generally, you need superheated steam to be an efficient process. We're just not able to produce enough steam. So a switch is made to an organic type fluid. So as an example, R245FA. Now this fluid has a, a boiling temperature of 15 degrees Celsius at room temperature. So we go from 212 with water down to 15. So now we're able to generate a high flow velocity stream using organic fluids and put that through a turbine to generate power. And that's where the uh, uh, opportunity arises. So generally less than 800 degrees F is what we would, what the industry regards as applicable for an organic Rankine cycle type application. So I'm going to show you uh, one project that we did uh, as, as an example. It was Transgas. They have a compressor station uh, in, I think it's Alberta or Saskatchewan. Uh, we did a turnkey project. We actually purchased, what, what you see here is the actual um, organic Rankine cycle uh, turbine and uh, power generation unit. Uh, we supplied the OTSG. We're OTSG suppliers, so we supplied the OTSG that extracted the heat from the flue gas stream. It was a solar turbine, uh, so solar gas turbine, uh, 4,500 uh, horsepower. It's a small turbine. The flue gas temperature, I think, was 750 Fahrenheit, 800, something like that. Anyways, this ended up uh, producing one megawatt of electrical power. Um, normally, it, this, this was going up to the atmosphere. Uh, it was put in and uh, is, is currently operating, producing one megawatt. So I don't want to get into too much detail here, uh, just for sake of time, but there are three major uh, loops. Uh, and I'll just talk about it briefly. There's a thermal oil loop where 
the heat from the gas turbine is picked up by uh, like a thermal fluid, like uh, thermonol 55 is what we used in this case. And then that goes over to the ORC vaporizer. And in, in, in this case here, we're vaporizing the uh, organic fluid that goes to a turbine. Turbine generates electricity and then it's recycled around. And part of the process also needs a cooling loop, which you can see in blue up there, so that we're able to condense the organic fluid back to a liquid after it's gone through the turbine so that it can be pumped and the, the whole process continues. This is what, uh, uh, this is the um, uh, organic, the ORC turbine unit that we used in this particular project. It was provided by Turboben, Turboden. Uh, they're located in Italy. Um, basically, the, uh, the hot uh, thermal oil uh, comes in over here. And this is where the uh, organic fluid is vaporized. It then goes into uh, the turbine at this location in here. And then the organic fluid exits the turbine, goes into this area, and there's a couple of different types of heat exchangers that extracts the remaining heat and preheats the organic fluid as it's going through its cycle. Just a picture of the uh, OTSG that we delivered uh, as part of this package. Um, there, there's, uh, because of the uh, use of organic fluids, uh, these units can't really operate dry. And uh, so we need to uh, include a bypass stack. So if, if the organic cycle is not available or if there's some hiccups, then the bypass stack opens and we divert the heat away from the heat exchanger. So we really got to look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of an or, uh, organic Rankin cycle system. It's low boiling point, so we get our efficiency. We can uh, generate power from it. They are automated. They're low operating pressures, which are safe. Um, the turbine operates always as a dry, with a dry fluid, so there's no erosion concerns on the turbine. The big challenge with ORC is cost. That's the big thing. And uh, really, for it to be feasible, the costs have to be less than $5,000 a kilowatt, uh, uh, a kilowatt of energy. Uh, actually, it should be more like $4,000. And it really only makes sense when it's like a regulated market where um, the, the producer using an ORC type plant is able to uh, have additional uh, revenue in in a regulated market where, let's say, you're paying six, 16 cents uh, a kilowatt hour uh, minimum. So innovation next steps that we're working on and we have worked on is doing away with that whole thermal oil loop. Let's, let's evaporate. To, yeah, just do direct. There are some real technical challenges with that because H, that R245FA, if you overheat it, you form um, fluoric acid. So you, you could have some catastrophic damage to your equipment if you start forming fluoric acid and cycling it through all your tubing. You can, so you can really do a lot of damage. And so there's some technical uh, hurdles around that and how the equipment's built in, in such a way that you're still protecting the equipment that you're not gonna overheat your organic fluid. You need to uh, have uh, proper controls um, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, so we want to eliminate the thermal oil transfer loop that reduces the cost. It's got to be more modular. Again, reduce cost. And then the turbo expander is actually an uh, expensive part of the equation. So as, as you can see, it's all about reducing cost. And that's kind of one of the biggest hurdles for an ORC type uh, power plant. So future challenges that we see. <laughs> We can, we can break it down into the different uh, regions in Canada. If we, if we look at the oil sands, um, in, t in today's market, uh, oil price market, there's not a lot of uh, investment going on. Um, everything is in a holding pattern. Producers are not making uh, uh, sufficient uh, revenue. It's, it's improving a little bit now with the price 
having gone up in the last few months. Uh, so there's a drive really to reduce that uh, capex, capital expen expenditure, and operating costs, opex. Uh, the other issue is Canada is pricing in uh, carbon taxes, right? So a lot of these producers in Alberta need to be paying. I think the cost is something like twenty dollars right now. It's per per a ton, but that's going to slowly go up, and so that's a, an additional uh, expense. And when you're competing with other countries that are not going to be carbon pricing the same, so let's let's look at the U.S. You know, we're competing against uh, shale oil. Well, shale oil uh, is a lower cost way of uh, uh, extracting oil from the ground. Uh, they don't have the uh, issues yet of uh, carbon pricing. So it just makes uh, the whole industry less profitable to the point that there is not a lot of investment happening right now. And um, so that, that, that's a bit of an issue. Uh, the drive, uh, the other issue is uh, driving to lower and lower NOx levels. Uh, our last project uh, we did in California, two ppm NOx and 5 ppm slip. Not all the ammonia gets reacted, some ends up going up the stack. The issue is when you get down to those levels, there's not a lot of room for any uh, f imbalances in the ammonia to NOx ratio entering the catalyst. It's extremely sensitive. You can't have any leakages because you're dealing with such small numbers that any small amount of leakage, any uh, inefficient areas of uh, reaction in the catalyst can make it so that you don't meet those limits. And uh, lastly, for organic Rankine cycle is just driving down the cost so that we, we see that as our major hurdle at this point. That's it. Questions. Questions. What's inside your competitor's box? Uh, you know, Climon or Chemion, or however you pronounce that. You know, they're selling these 0 0.5 megawatt, you know, modules that can fit on a trailer. You know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with those. Okay, it's come, to, it's out of Sweden. Okay. Yeah, we uh, contacted them, wrote in the, our group contacted them, and they expressed a profound disinterest in Canada. Oh yeah. No, it's. it's I, I, it's, it's I like market. to. The market in Canada is. Uh, I'd like to know more about that, for sure. 0 0.5 megawatts? I think it's, what is, it? is that the size of the Jimmy Young trailer? Or 0 0.2? Roy, do you remember? Yeah, it's point something, I'm sorry. Maybe 0 0.5 is a bit high, yeah. but it, it was intended for low temperature, uh, for low grade heat geothermal. Okay. Uh, so maybe the input temperatures would be like, you know, 100 degrees Celsius, uh -huh. 90, 110. Output temperatures maybe 50. So yeah. So that was, uh, so I presume it was, you know, ORC inside. Yeah, for but, sure. But how, how they manage it is, uh, was a question. Yeah, maybe that's something I, look, I would look into for sure. More questions? Right on the screen. So have you looked at like, the uh, organic ranking cycle and just focusing at really low temperatures? You don't have any of the issues at high temperatures, so low temperatures mean 200 C below? We haven't looked at something that, that we'll, low. We'll get them looking at that. We'll get, okay. <laughs> our, our, our biggest issue is we're a manufacturer. We need to make a product that somebody wants. So the cost is a major issue for us right now. Uh, and our experience to date hasn't been all that great. We haven't been able to get it down in that five thousand dollars a kilowatt. Yeah. So that's. So if you design I, for the two hundred. Yeah. If there's a. You would, you'd have some of the savings you're identifying, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and of course, like you said, in, in a regulated market, to just to give you an example, the Northwest Territories guarantees that all customers have 18 cents per kilowatt hour electricity. Hmm. And in remote communities, with diesel generators, it gets up to $1.50 or $2. True cost. 
that's why there's a an area in there, a market area in there, where low temperature racking systems might be profitable because of exactly your point that it's a regulated market uh -huh. and they want to drive their costs down because they're still going to be selling it at 18 cents a kilowatt hour to their client. But there's the big push on to reduce carbon. But once you get north of 60, well, there's a little bit of hydro near Yellowknife uh, and uh, in northern Saskatchewan or just across the border. But anyway, once you get north of 60, it's, uh, it's pretty well all diesel except for maybe Tuk Yak Tuk that has a natural gas well. But everything else is all diesel. So there are niches. And the reason I think that's important for IST is that if you can develop a technology within a niche, knowing full well that this technology is not going to compete in downtown Los Angeles, mm -hmm. it does give you a technical footprint from which you can do innovations and cost reductions and reducing of cat tax. Yeah, for sure. You understand my, the, the, the point that I'm getting at? Yeah. yeah. So the last time we had a meeting about three months ago or whatever it was, I broached that topic and I realized that I didn't express it very well. But that's kind of like what we're, uh, we're looking at and you fed right into that when you started talking about regulated markets and mm -hmm. uh, markets where the, where the local Yeah, we, I, think, I think there's a niche there that might be that you might be able to exploit to drive some R and D. I, I I agree. Like uh, R and D to uh, find the right solution uh, for that kind of market is, yeah. and it had to be a solution that uh, is is uh, easy installation in in the field, low cost, low maintenance, and uh, especially those remote communities. Right, oh, right. it has to be. Yeah. It's not, not a lot of sophisticated support, so. More questions? Just out of curiosity, if you, in a uh, grid scale uh, natural gas turbine system, uh, if you have a one through just a natural gas turbine, uh, your overall efficiencies are Yeah, I'd, I'd say 45%. Yeah. And then when you add on uh, your uh, OT, uh, SG uh, on the rear end of this uh, gas turbine, what does it bump it up to? Um, I mean, be positive. Go ahead. You know. No, I, I, I don't know if I know that number, but I'm, I would guess it's going to be in the 55% range. Okay, in the 55%. But I'd have to go back. Like... Uh, a power plant that's producing, let's say, two LM6000s, each one's producing, let's say, 40 megawatts, that's 80 megawatts. The steam turbine produces around another 25, 30 megawatts. So you're, you're producing another 25 megawatts on top of uh, 80, so it's a 25% increase. Now, what's the, in general, when you're dealing with uh, natural gas, the percentage of sulfur that comes through is? Generally, it's very clean. Generally, uh, it's pipeline gas. There's not too much. We've done uh, projects in uh, Hawaii, and in, in those areas, they actually burn an oil. So uh, I don't know if it's diesel or... Yeah, there's a little bit of sulfur in it. Uh, but generally, sulfur is not a huge issue. Well, have not, you put any of your systems on rear ends of coal-fired No. Burners? No. Or is that just too sulfur? Well, you've got a, a lot of ash to deal with as, as well, too. Oh, yes, um, that's true. Uh, you could do, a, you could do you, a electrostatic precipitation, hot precipitation, yeah. before you get into your system. You could, yeah. Uh, we, that's one market that we haven't... Because okay. that market operates, uh, I mean, 30% efficiency is pretty good. Yeah. You know, 40% efficiency is, I think, unheard of in coal fire power plants. Some of the new ones might be yeah. getting close to 40, but you know, if, not one, if once through steam generation you could you know, bump that up to 55, well then you, you're saving a lot of greenhouse gases. Uh, and maybe without having to do a full capex, I mean, walking away from your coal-fired power plant is what I mean. Yeah. It would seem to me that that would be a kind of a... 
especially in the short term before the they short, actually, exactly. in the long term, they're still going to, I think, wind down the coal-fired so power plants. Like three generations from now. Yeah, it's always going to be slower than you think. Yeah, you know, it's not going to happen in the next decade like something. No. Uh, I'm going to assure you that Alex will be here for the next 10 to 15 minutes to do networking with you guys before we go for lunch. So I would like to thank you all for your participation for today's talk. Uh, thank you so much. And Alex, on behalf of Wisen University of Waterloo, we would like to thank you for your time and uh, sharing some wonderful insights with us. Thank you so much. Great, thank you.